I would like to invite each of you to listen careful to God's voice in your heart. Listen to his voice. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Open your hearts, open up your hearts to Christ. The deepest joy there is in life is the joy that comes from God and is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the hope of yours. Welcome back, class. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that introduction there from the voice of John Paul II himself. I'm coming to you guys today from another medium, uh, from Rua Radio. So you guys have had me in person, you've had me on video, you've had me on webcam, you've had me now from Rua uh, Radio Studios. So hopefully we don't botch this and the equipment works fine. My voice isn't coming across super loud or obnoxious. Maybe it is anyway. I don't know. So uh, today, we're getting into the uh, sacraments of marriage. We're now into the second part of John Paul II's Theology of the Body, the second half of it, I should say. And so we talked about eschatological man last week, and uh, there were some people that said, you know, they found parts of that difficult. And I would just like to assure you guys that it is totally, you're, you're right on pace if you found that difficult. So the, again, this is the the idea too is to uh, spurn further reflection to really get you uh, into a deeper dive, a deeper search, and hopefully into eventually a full reading of the text itself. And um, this class should be helping you guys to uh, get acquainted, to get oriented in the text itself, and uh, that you can start to apply this to your own life, and then also. Um, you know, go deeper. The text itself is 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 large, but you know, including the uh, the audiences that were um, later uh, added, the ones he didn't have a chance to give. There's 133, so I believe that's correct. Um, so you know, it's 133 audiences. If you wanted to, you could even read them in 133 days as a some sort of devotional, and um, that'd be a heck of a, a heck of a marathon. But it'd be worth it. So. Uh, now getting to the dimension of covenant and grace, the sacrament of marriage. Uh, we've, we've talked about original man, historical man. We've talked about the fall. We've talked about lust. We've talked about eschatological man. So like kind of the three ages of man. Now that sets the, the table for understanding the sacrament of marriage. Because again, John Paul II wrote the theology of the body, spurned on in his theor- the, the, sorry theological reflections, based off of Humani Vitae. So marriage is obviously a crucial uh, part of all of this. In these 17 general audiences, um, addresses delivered between July 28th, 1982 and December 15th, 1982, John Paul begins applying his total vision of man to an understanding of the sacramentality of marriage and its divine dimension of, quote, covenant and grace. Um. This cycle presents some of the richest and most provocative theological assertions of the entire catechesis. Because again, he's really, he's bringing this train full circle here. And so you just start to find some things linked up, so to speak. Um, there are some loose ends that begin to be tied together. Uh, so the, a primary text for this that we need to understand is um, Ephesians five twenty one through 33. Now this gets at times can be used um, by people for the wrong reasons. And I'll, I'll read it to you and then we'll discuss why that is. Um, so here's the text, Ephesians 5, 21, 33. Also, I forgot that like I did, I think the past three classes to start off prayer. So we're going to do that in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us to gather here today to discuss the work of this great saint, which he pulled from the divine revelation that you gave us. We ask for the intercession of the most immaculate Virgin Mary and for the intercession of St. John Paul II, that we might 
receive the grace that we need to have this opened up, that I might receive the grace I need to speak eloquently about it, and that all those who are listening right now might receive the grace they need to have it change their heart. We pray, Lord, that your grace may be on this seventh session of this Theology of the Body class. And we trust all these things to you, Lord Jesus Christ, through the Immaculate Heart of the Mother you gave to us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So back to where we were, uh, Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Ephesians five twenty one through 33. So there are several things to talk about there. Um, sorry, just uh, bumped the mic there. You might have heard a little bit of a boom. There are many things to discuss when we're talking about this. And um, the this, there's several um, things to get to here as we're talking about this passage, which again... This passage has been used by certain people to say um, to show some sort of male chauvinism that that the man should lord over the wife, and that's biblical. That wives are to submit to their husbands, um, absolutely in some sort of authoritarian rule. That is completely ridiculous and absurd, and that's not at all what um, Paul is saying here. So. Uh, The above key and classic text takes us to the threshold of the meaning and mystery of the universe, to the threshold of discovering the glory and greatness that God has bestowed on us by creating us as male and female and calling us to become one flesh. It's not coincidental that in our day, uh, this passage is often vehemently contested for the reasons I kind of just mentioned. Here we glimpse uh, a great clash of two competing humanisms and their respective views of the human body and the meaning of sexuality. Nor is it coincidental that this passage is followed by the call to take up arms in the great spiritual battle. Quote, gird your loins with the truth, as we read in Ephesians 6.14. Um, when we, we have to discuss what we mean here by the mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Again, we're going we're gonna to kind of glance over this again. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, void of the gift, the feminist revolt against Ephesians 5 is quite understandable. They see it as a surrender to tyranny. But luckily, we are not devoid of the gift. The gift is that Christ came not to be served, but to serve, to lay down his life for his bride. See Matthew uh, 20 and 28 there. God is not a tyrant, of course. Um, That's not at all how God uh, reveals himself. The paradigm of master-slave is completely foreign to Christianity, which we've also mentioned in this class, is completely foreign to the gospel. St. Paul does not justify male domination, Again, remember, that is a result of the fall that we read in Genesis 3.16. At no point in time are we saying that is the proper ethos or intersubjective dynamic that the man is to dominate the wife. That, again, we read in Genesis was a result of the fall. He's actually calling husbands and wives to live the gift of God's original plan in which there was a perfect balance, a complementarity, and a recognition of the equal dignity between the sexes. In effect, 
Paul says submission means one thing to the Gentiles, but it must be very different for Christians. Christian spouses must submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, you would think this would be, um, oh, um, maybe obvious, but I have seen in many circles where um, I saw on uh, Catholic Twitter probably about a year ago where there were women on Catholic Twitter who were celebrating in like owning this, owning owning the fact that I'm going to submit to my husband out of some uh, master-slave relationship. And I kid you not, these were apparent Catholics and pushing this. Uh, and it, it could not be any more wrong. It sounds absolutely ridiculous that someone should think this way. But again, there have been many misinterpretations of the gospel. And this just kind of plays into that. Um, so again... Paul's saying that we're submitting out of reverence for Christ, so we have to we have to understand what that means. Um, with regard to the Gentiles, Christians must no longer live as the Gentiles do. They are darkened in their understanding due to their hardness of heart. So put off your old nature, uh, which is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So again... The Christian message is it uh, calls for a transformation, um, not um, a sublimation. But Christ makes all things new. So the broken relationships, the the effects of the fall, Christ the surgeon is reversing these things, and Paul is calling us, uh, exhorting us to live as new creations. Now that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, now that we are called to live like Christ to live our life modeled after him, this is manifested especially in the sacrament of marriage, where we lay down our lives for one another, not lording over one another. I'm not sure why anyone would um, uh, take that up. But St. Paul is not, uh, as we read, I think this is from TOB 89.5.6, St. Paul is not afraid to accept the concepts that were um, characteristic of the mentality and customs of that time. Certainly, our contemporary sensitivity is different, and the social position of women in comparison with men is different. Nevertheless, the underlying principle that we find in Ephesians remains the same and bears the same fruits. To submit to one's spouse means to be completely given. In turn, mutual submission means a reciprocal gift of self. When Christ is the source and at the same time the model of that submission— it confers on the conjugal union a deep and mature character. So we should really be seeing here how, what um, Paul is talking about here. John Paul II offers really a tremendous opening up of these words and, ex and explanation. When Paul says to be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, he does not intend to say that the husband is master of the wife and that the interpersonal covenant property in marriage is a contract of domination by the, by the husband over the wife. The love to which St. Paul calls husbands clearly excludes every kind of submission by which the wife might become a servant or slave of the husband, an object of one-sided submission. Love makes the husband simultaneously subject to the wife and subject in this to the Lord himself as the wife is to the husband. In imaging Christ in the church, the husband is above all the one who loves, and the wife, by contrast, is the one who is loved. One might even venture uh, the idea that the wife's submission to the husband means above all the experiencing of love. This is all the more so because the submission refers to the image of the submission of the church to Christ, which is certainly can uh, certainly consists in experiencing His love. Um, so thus, the the reverence of which the author of Ephesians speaks is nothing more than a spiritually mature form of that fascination of the man for femininity and of the woman for masculinity, which reveals itself for the first time in Genesis. If a husband is truly to love his wife, it is necessary to insist that intercourse must not serve merely as a means for allowing his um, his own pleasure, but that it goes both uh, ways simultaneously. Uh, this can never become a hedonistic 
uh, but always altruistic. So the dynamic of uh, the husband relation, husband wife relationship, in in the Christian context, is one of mutual submission out of out of reverence for Christ, out of love for one another. The husband lays down his life for the wife, and the wife accepts the lo- the life or excuse me the love of the husband. Of course, that's not to say that the wife is not called to. Uh, lay down her life and love her, love her husband, or to sacrifice as many wives uh, can attest to. That is definitely not the case. Um, but again, we're pointing to the general proper dynamic here, and this passage has been one um, that's controversial, especially if you isolate parts of it. I've had people who are not practicing Christians who knew that I was come to me and say, "Hey, you see this? See this here? Um, see this is why Christianity is wrong." And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, that's not even the entire passage. You pulled out a sentence of it, it took it out of context, and now it's it mean it looks like it can mean something completely uh, different. So we have to understand too here what comes into play and crucial in this part of theology of the body is the spousal analogy. The spousal analogy is not merely a metaphor, but it helps us to penetrate into the very essence of the mystery. See uh, TOB 95 there. The spousal image takes us beyond other bubble, uh, biblical images, such as a vine, vine branches and shepherd sheep, and its revelation of God's uh, mystery. As sacrament, as a sacrament, marriage efficaciously communicates the mystery it symbolizes. If the spousal analogy illuminates the relationship of Christ and the church, Christ's love for the church in turn illuminates the relationship of spouses. Pardon me while I grab myself here something to drink. We have new microphones, but I'm praying that the microphones aren't so good that they pick up me like drinking (laughs) because that is really, is not the worst when you're trying to listen to a YouTube video. I've had at times where I'm trying to listen to someone give a lecture and all I can hear is their lip smacking and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is this is completely unlistenable. So I'm hoping that that is not the case here as I'm sipping my Diet Coke. So, but anyway, back to the importance of the spousal analogy. It illuminates the relationship of Christ and the church, Christ's love for the church. And as you'll see in the session, we're going to get to the Song of Songs, uh, a the book that appears in the middle of the Bible and is, has been a favorite among mystics for many, many years. John Paul II, especially. The reason for that is that mystics have experienced the love of God in uh, a really unique and incredible way. And uh, what the mystics have found is the only words that can begin to help describe these experiences of God in prayer, these mystical experiences, is the reflections of love in Song of Songs. Um, And there's been, throughout history, people that have thought the Song of Songs is too too explicit. So that's where um, the the temptation to see uh, love, to see um, all these things, uh, the body, you know, and, and erotic love as dirty, but we have to reclaim the erotic. Erotic love is not one. It would be easy to equate erotic, the very word erotic, to like pornography. And, um, and certainly pornography um, has co-opted some of these words. But erotic in itself that is not a dirty word. It's not a negative word. It's pointing toward um, a certain manifestation of love and we find this especially in uh, the Song of Songs, which we'll get to. So, um, a little bit from TLB 90 here on this espousal analogy. As one can see, this analogy works in two directions, both in the direction of a deeper understanding of Christ and the church, and in the direction of a deeper understanding of marriage. In fact, at the basis of the understanding of marriage, in its very essence, stands Christ's spousal relationship with the church. In turn, marriage becomes a visible sign of the eternal divine mystery, according to the image of the church united with Christ. 
In this way, Ephesians leads us to the very foundations of the sacramentality of marriage. We see how deeply the author of Ephesians looks into sacrament, uh, sacramental reality when he proclaims the great analogy, both the union of Christ with the church and the spousal union of man and woman in marriage are in this way illuminated by a particular supernatural light. That's from TOB 91.8. I really like to pepper in some of these quotes from the audiences here to you guys. I hope you don't think I'm reading them too much, but the reason being I want you to see uh, if even if you don't have the book itself, I know we're reading through the Mary Healy book, but even if you don't have the um, book itself, uh, the the audiences that is, I want I want you to get, get a little familiarity with the wording and with some of the direct language, and that's why I want to help pepper some of these things in here. Um, one more thing here from uh, uh, Tob ninety three. One must admit that the very essence of marriage contains a particle of the divine mystery. Otherwise, this whole analogy would hang in a void. In the Old Testament, the mystery which is expressed and in some way explained through the spousal analogy is barely outlined, half open as it were. In Ephesians, by contrast, it is fully unveiled without ceasing to be a mystery, of course. It is obvious that the analogy of human spousal love cannot offer an adequate and complete understanding of the divine mystery. God's mystery remains transcendent with respect to this analogy as with respect to any other analogy. At the same time, however, this analogy offers the possibility of a certain cognitive penetration into the very essence of the mystery. The analogy of spousal love contains a characteristic of the mystery that is not directly emphasized by any other analogy and used in the Bible. So, an additional um, analogy while we're on the subject of analogies here that we want to talk about that's mentioned in Ephesians 5. 23 is the head and the body. Because if you'll remember as we read here, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. The head body analogy here presents, uh, uh, presents spouses as one organic union, one organism. Uh, one thing to draw as comparison here to in the Second Vatican Council, um, oh man, that I'm totally, my, my daughter woke up at 3 a.m. so I'm slipping here mentally a little bit, but uh, in the Second Vatican Council, the Constitution on, um, I can't believe I can't remember the name of the document. I've studied these for years. The Constitution on the Church. The, uh, the, the Second Vatican Council and that beautiful Constitution on the Church talks about how the, it, it, how the Church is an organism and that Christ is the head. And there's even uh, saints who have used the analogy that, um, that Mary is the neck, that she's the, that she's the neck of the Church to... Uh, further help to use analogies here. And so um, that is consistent. That analogy is used in the documents to describe the relationship um, and the nature of the church. That the, na- the church is not some static thing, but that in fact the church, um, the, the church is a living organism. And so too, um, the, the, the sacrament of marriage and the husband and wife are no longer two, but one flesh. And um, there enters the analogy here. If the body expresses the person by becoming one body, spouses become in some sense one person or one subject. But one key difference here, without blurring their individuality. So we can never, the key here is that they become one flesh, that union, one subject. But, we can never say that either one of the spouses is sublimated into the other, or that they're uh, erased. That would be anathema to John Paul II in his, in his understanding of personalism. Um, but it's, it's both and. So one retains their individual identity while becoming united with their spouse. And in fact, the idea is that one's individual ide- uh, identity should be becoming more cultivated, more mature, more holy, in this marriage, in this union. So therefore, 
not only do they not lose their individuality, but that they should it should be becoming more perfected through the grace of God. And so if there's never marriages where, and Lord knows there probably have, there, there has been, um, where one spouse seems to just completely, um, oh, what's the word you want to eclipse the other, whether it's through a dominating personality or what have you, that can be a danger. You should not lose your personality. You should not lose who you are. You should be coming perfected in that relationship of, of becoming one body. Recall that Christ says any proper headship among his followers must not be modeled after the Gentiles who lord it over their subjects and make their authority felt. Instead, the Lord must be the servant. See again uh, also Luke 22, 25 through 26. Conjugal love uh, is so unifying that it allows spouses to, uh, quote, interpenetrate each other, belonging spiritually to one another to the point that the one who loves his wife loves himself. The I becomes in some sense the you and the you the I. Spouses are undivided in spirit and flesh, truly two in one flesh, where the flesh is one, one also is the spirit. That's from Catechism 1642. Um, so the school of philosophy that I was formed in, which is that of John Paul II and the other great personalists like John Henry Newman, um, and then people like Dietrich von Hildebrand, Edith Stein, um, there's, this has always been, um, a, I hate to use this word because I know it can seem a bit much, but this has always been a great metaphysical problem. It's the question of the one in the many, uh, could even be thought to play in here, um, how can one re- retain their individuality and yet become one with another? Um, but we must understand here that the analogy does not blur the individuality of the subjects. That's the bottom line. That's what we were saying here. There is no doubt that Christ is a subject distinct from the church. Still, in virtue of a particular relationship, he makes himself one with her as an organic union of head and body. Therefore, the spouse's unisubjectivity, if you will, is built on the base of, of bisubjectivity and does not have a real but intentional character. Um, now, also, as should be played into and come into play here, we're talking about beauty and holiness because, as we also read here in Ephesians, Christ gave himself up for her that she might be holy and without blemish. A beautiful body for St. Paul expresses spiritual beauty, holiness. We call this too metaphysical beauty. Dietrich von Hildebrand wrote an entire book on aesthetics, and he wrote about this metaphysical beauty, which can be thought to be understood as spiritual beauty. So think, of, for instance, about the beauty of the saints, Dietrich von Hildebrand was converted um, by the saints. He sensed and saw in the saints, particularly uh, St. Francis of Assisi, he saw this otherworldly beauty, this transcendent beauty, almost like a perfume coming from the saints that he didn't see anywhere else. And Dietrich von Hildebrand grew up in a family that was extremely cultivated, highly in tune to the arts. And... Um, their family, his family was actually really just a religious, um, agnostic, really, if you will. And so not really believers by any means, but little Dietrich had a great love for, uh, religion from an early age. It was peculiar in that way, but his, his family wasn't for it, for all intentions, their God was the arts. And so Dietrich grew up, his, his dad was a famous sculptor, world renowned sculptor. And so Dietrich von Hildebrand, who again had such an influence on John Paul II, he grew up um, with a very cultivated sense of beauty. And that might have played a part in his, um, his understanding of the saints. His, uh, I had the exact same experience of my conversion was because of the saints. And this almost otherworldly beauty, this metaphysical beauty. And by metaphysical beauty, we mean it's not solely bound up in their, um, their proportions, their... Um, it's not, it's not reliant upon them being objectively beautiful in the sense that the world might think of it. Uh, 
but that the Mother Teresa or any other saint that you can think of, that there's something about them that draws us in, and that is a spiritual beauty. Um, and that's the... Yeah, it kind of points toward the beauty that we're speaking about here, the beauty without blemish, the holiness. There's the beauty the, and the attraction of holiness. Just how someone can be also, might be objectively beautiful by the world standards, a model or something like that, but that they, if their personality or their spiritual life could be such that there's actually something extremely ugly about them, very off-putting, something detestable and disgusting and so it points to this spiritual beauty. Again, we're not pointing toward uh, some sort of dualism here, as if the body is one thing, the spiritual world is another. No, they're they're one. In, in fact, that's what we're saying is that the saint, as an embodied being, is manifesting the spiritual beauty. That's how the body reveals God, and that's again that's the key to all of this that we're saying about the theology of the body. The body reveals God, and that's. The, the spiritual in the spirituality and the holiness that we're we're pointing to here Christ loved his bride when she was full of blemishes of sin and he took her quote unquote ugliness so that she might be quote beautiful Christ cleanses us from all the stains of uh, all the, all that stains us in the nuptial bath of baptism and nourishes us with his beauty in the wedding feast of the Eucharist what is our culture really looking for in its quest for the ideal body, the ideal beauty. I mean, that's really something you should come away from this reflecting on too. What is the world's definition of beauty? Um, and then the church's understanding of beauty. How can we uh, think about the beauty of, um, haven't you ever seen, you know, moving on the saints that brought you to tears or, you know, um, think of the, even the passion of Christ, Mel Gibson's The Passion. There are scenes in it where one would think this is objectively ugly. Christ is being brutally beaten with, uh, and his skin is being ripped off and he's being nailed to a cross. He's being pummeled and hammered and spit upon. And at the end, of course, he's raised up on the cross and he's just saying, Father, forgive them. They not they know not what they they do, and um, he cries out from the cross. There's something here that this should be ugly. This is a human being filleted alive and being stripped naked, humiliated, and being nailed to a cross. This should be horrendously ugly. Yet we know that. In that moment, we see the full revelation of God's love for humanity. We see God's love unveiled. And so we see in the crucifixion, especially in this part with um, Mel Gibson, we see, well, not with Mel Gibson himself, in this movie, this moment is a beautiful moment that moves countless people to tears. And um, that is the beauty of holiness. And so we have to make a distinction here between physical physical beauty per se and the spiritual beauty that is manifested through the physical world, through incarnate beings who are both uh, body and soul composite. Um, so really, to, I would like to quote TOB 92.2 here. Um, it's significant that the image of the glorious church is presented as a bride all beautiful in her body. Certainly this is a metaphor, but it is a very eloquent one and testifies how deeply important the body is in the analogy of spousal love. Um, for St. Paul, the human body indicates attributes and qualities of the moral, spiritual, and supernatural order. He is able to explain the whole reality of redemption, which is essentially spiritual and supernatural through the likeness of the body and of the love by which husband and wife become one flesh. TOB 92.3 So, again, we're pointing to marriage here, to sacraments and mystery. A little remedial thing here for you. Sacrament is the more ancient, broader meaning of the word, refers to the revelation of the eternal mystery hidden in God. Um, 
And mystery is the only word we can utter to speak of the invisible divine reality. So together, these words, mystery sacrament, refer to the hidden, revealed dimensions of God and his plan for humanity. Sacraments reveal spiritual mysteries through physical signs. Sign simply here meaning the visibility of the invisible. So this should help us to dial into more about, again, what we're all saying here about beauty, about the spiritual world manifested through the physical order, most especially through the body. Think of the beauty of the sunset, the sunrise. Think about um, the beauty of the created order, the natural world, and the spiritual beauty that can that can seem to be rising from that. Yet you, sitting here listening to this right now, can manifest the spiritual beauty of God in a way that nothing else in creation can. And that is the greatness of the human person. That is the body. That is the that is that is the thesis of um, the theology of the body. Is the uniqueness of the human person who themselves can look upon the sunset in and see the beauty of God manifested in his creation, yet they're very sitting there in that resplendor of the sunset, contemplating that in a prayerful attitude are actually manifesting a beauty far greater than that sunset. They're manifesting a beauty that only the person who's made in the image and likeness of God can. Well, only a person. There are no persons who are not. A person by very definition is. And so they're the only one in creation who can. That's the great irony there of the one staring and looking at that sunset and seeing the beauty of God's created orders. They themselves are brighter than that sunset at that moment. They are that creation of God alive. And, and what is that famous quote um, that what God, uh, what God really wants is man fully alive? And so... Um, that in certain sense is what holiness is, is man fully alive. And so the sacrament here, this should, as, a, as a Catholic, this should be ringing true to you. The sacrament is the tangible sign, the manifestation of the invisible spiritual reality. Um, sacraments reveal spiritual mysteries through physical signs. Signs simply means the visibility of the invisible. So think about the body when you're thinking about that. The good news of the gospel is that is that which was hidden in God from eternity has been revealed first through the sign of man and woman's original unity and definitively the sign of the union of Christ and church. Um, so what we need to point to here too is that marriage is a primordial sacrament. We don't mean um, marriage is like the highest sacraments. The Eucharist is the highest sacrament. However, marriage is the oldest. The Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, as we read in Ephesians. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. By linking the one flesh union of Genesis with the one union of Christ in the church, St. Paul helps us to see that marriage pointed us to Christ right from the beginning. This means that God the Father chose us in Christ not only after we sinned and not only in order to redeem us um, from sin. The incarnation should not be considered an afterthought second plan intended to rectify the first which was supposedly thwarted when man sinned. The incarnate Christ is the center of the universe and of history. Again, remember what we said in the first class about the fall of man, the original man before the cosmos, and that that the fall of man even brought the fall and the, the wounding of the cosmos. In Christ now, Christ is the incarnate man, the incarnate man, that's a, that's a, uh, that's redundant. He is incarnate. 
and he's the word made flesh, now the center of the universe, the one who uh, heals, brings healing to the wounding of the world, most especially man, of course. God's eternal plan is that Christ would leave his father and be joined to his bride in one flesh. Sin cannot and did not thwart this plan. God's plan for man and for the universe continues despite sin. Recall our reflections on knowledge and procreation. Um, God's original plan continues even after sin. Although it limps and awaits the fullness of redemption, it awaits the new Eve who will bear a child with the help of the Lord. We should definitely think here of uh, Mary. Um, uh, so, we went to point to sa- the sacrament of redemption. There's a sign which sums up the mystery of creation in a sign which sums up the mystery of redemption. The union of a husband and a wife and the totality of the sacrament of creation is the most ancient sign of the mystery. That's why we call it the primordial. The union of Christ and the church is the totality of the sacrament of redemption. It is the definitive sign of the mystery revealed in the fullness of time. Each communicates the grace, the original gracing of creation and the new, quote-unquote, gracing of redemption. The longing for union we all experience as a lasting reminiscence of the sacrament of creation prepares us to open our hearts to the union with Christ in the sacrament of redemption. So marriage is a figure and as sacrament of the new covenant. The one and only sacrament of the mystery of creation prepares us for the seven sacraments of the mystery of redemption. Marriage is in some way the model and prototype of all the sacraments. It is not only one in the list of seven. It helps us to understand all of the sacraments. The goal of all the sacraments is to unite us with Christ, of course, the bridegroom, so that we might be impregnated, so to speak, with divine life. Not just really so to speak, but like, no, literally, you're, you're going to be infused with divine life. It's as if the original sacrament was fractured by the original sin into seven sacraments. And all of which bear the mark of the one and only sacrament of the beginning. As the primordial sacrament, marriage constitutes the figure and thus the likeness, the analogy according to which the new economy of salvation is built. That's from TOB 98.2. Marriage is organically inscribed in the new sacraments of redemption, just as it was inscribed in the original sacrament of creation. Indeed, through the new covenant of Christ with the church, marriage is inscribed anew in the sacrament of man, which embraces the universe. Um, you might be hearing some things, um, uh, because we're in the middle of building our studio and so we're not in a soundproof room yet. So if you hear any hooting and hollering, that is my people here at Rua Woods. Um, actually, sorry, I had to... I had to make sure that people (laughs) were being quiet. So, um, you guys probably thought you lost me there. You are not that lucky. So, the sacraments um, in the redemption of the body. You guys have heard me say sacrament about a thousand times today. That's the point. It's really, again, we're pointing to marriage, sacrament. Think we're, We're talking here about redemption and marriage. In the uh, how we can understand those two in light of each other, and again, that's because God comes for His people. Marriage symbolizes and shows that. You should also be getting uh, to hear to understand why divorce is so. Why, as my old professor used to say, why God hates divorce. It's because it's not because God wants these two people who apparently can't get along together to stay together um, per se. Like it's deeper than that. It's richer than that because marriage is deeper than that and is richer than that. And just as God would never be cut off 
would never cut himself off from his people. Um, and marriage symbolizes um, this covenant. Divorce somehow shows forth and represents a a rupture in the created order. Divorce becomes kind of an anti-sacrament, a quasi-sacrament in the sense of um, that it, it's an anti-sacrament insofar as it can show us, can make manifest a, a, a division and a breaking forth of what was never meant to be broken forth. So, um, you know, as we're pointing to the positive connotations here between redemption and marriage, it should also be highlighting, like, again, why the church teaches what the church does on divorce and contraception and abortion and all of these things, because there is a normative created order established by God because it is good in itself and beautiful in itself and manifests God and his magnificence and revelation. And to try and disfigure that is an abomination. Really, that's the only that's that's the only word that you can really call it. Um, sorry, I'm checking to see how we are doing on time here because I don't want you guys to um, have to be with me for longer than what you have to be, unless you want to be. But the sacrament given as grace and assigned as an ethos. The gospel reveals that redemptive grace has been poured into the very depths of the human heart, enabling men and women, whatever their weaknesses and sins, to respond to the call to marriage just as it was instituted in the beginning. And as St. Paul exhorts in Ephesians 5, that's why when the Pharisees asked Jesus, uh, Moses allowed us to be divorced, what the heck's the deal? What do you say? And, you know, they even said, but who can do this? Who can be married? Who can be married without, who, who can get married without divorcing their wife is almost as if they were saying that. I mean, that's how poorly their, their view of marriage was. But what we're saying here is that uh, the good news, the gospel, the grace has been poured out into man, and now we're being called to marriage, it, just as it was instituted in the beginning. Christ opens marriage to the salvific action of God, to the powers flowing from the redemption of the body, which help to overcome the consequences of sin and to build the unity of man and women according to the Creator's eternal plan. By following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses, spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. That's from Catechism 1615. The sacrament of marriage is an exhortation addressed to man, male and female, that they might conscientiously share in the redemption of the body, Historical man must find again the dignity and holiness of conjugal union on the basis of the mystery of redemption. Ooh, that is big time right there. That is two B one hundred. Put that, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I don't recommend that you actually smoke anything, but um, that put that in the memory bank and really sta- staple that on your on your tack board. Put it on your fridge. Whatever you got to do. I'm gonna repeat it because it kind of. It sums up and ties together really what we've been talking about here. The sacrament of marriage is an exhortation addressed to man, male and female, that they might conscientiously share in the redemption of the body. Historical man must find again the dignity and holiness of conjugal union on the basis of the mystery of redemption. TOB 100, 4, and 6. You should also be getting used to the Theology of the Body Catechesis numbering by now because I've been reading them off and hopefully you guys are starting to figure them out. And they're, they're bold and listed pretty well in the, um, in the audiences. So again, remember what we talked about life according to the Spirit in the previous, I think it was in session 5. Um it is the holiness of sorry it is it is the holy spirit who empowers spouses to live the christian ethos of marriage as much as lust distorts the human heart even more so does the holy spirit transform and revive it um so there's hope here we we're, we're calling upon the very again what what we mean by grace is the very life of god manifested in us 
So we're closer to Jesus than we could have been even when he was walking here on earth because now we receive him in, in Holy Communion. We receive the Holy Spirit, the very life of God, the life of the Holy Trinity should be alive and well in us as long as we're living in the state of grace. As a sacrament, marriage is an efficacious expression of the saving power of God. Through the redemption of the body, one can master the concupiscence of the flesh, that tendency toward an egotistical satisfaction. And in the sacramental covenant of masculinity and femininity, flesh itself becomes a specific substratum of a lasting and indissoluble communion of persons in a manner worthy of persons. TOB 101. I mean, this is so rich. I hope you can guys can see why this is the second half of the catechesis. When I first started diving into theology body, I couldn't, I didn't quite understand like what the two halves, it didn't seem to make sense how it was ordered, but, um, you know, maybe that's just me, but you can see what we've talked about anthropologically about man in the three phases of life is now it's all coming to four. It's all coming to help us understand what, why, why we're talking about the sacrament of marriage. And again, this is not excluding Virginia for the sake of the kingdom too. Uh, we didn't quite have as much time as I would have liked to, to dive into that in, in the eschatological section. Um, but again, I would like to restate about that. This is not saying that this is not when we, when we hold up the beauty and the importance of marriage or, or, or Virginia for the sake of the kingdom, we're not pitting those two against each other in any way that can never possibly be stated enough because it seems so often people have that temptation to do that. Oh, you're just married. Oh, you're just a consecrated virgin. What's the matter? You don't want to get married or what's the matter? You can hack it in a whole in uh, in a, rel- a religious order. You can hack it in priesthood. As someone who was in the seminary and was thought I was going to be a priest and I'm now married, I can tell you that that's real. People thinking, "Oh, it's a matter you couldn't hack it." It's not that at all. It's it's discernment. We we try we have to discern our vocations. And um, so what we're talking about here, life according to the Spirit, and it's important. And marriage is just as important for consecrated life. Of course, really, what we're seeing here is life. Now that we're called to life in the Spirit, we have the aid of God Himself to live out our vocations. So whether that's you or feel called to live out the vocation to the priesthood or to religious life, consecrated virginity, um, or you feel called to marriage, that they each require the grace of God because they're all are, um, whether it's holy orders, they're all, or, or sacrament of marriage, it's all, res- nest- sorry, stepping over my own feet here. You need the grace of God. All right, let's just say that. You, <laughs> It all requires the life of God. And again, I would really like to highlight that part. I know I've said it a few times, but when we speak about grace, very often I think people can take that word grace and turn it into some sort of just like sentimental word with no real tangible meaning. It's just like, yeah, by the grace of God, as if just like some abstract help that God gave me. But grace, the very energies, the very life of God, I, I use the term energies because I'm again I'm Byzantine Catholic and that's that's a whole different pod that's a whole different podcast to get into that a whole um, reason for the use of the term energies. However, as a Byzantine Catholic and Eastern uh, theological reflection, the grace of God, the very energies of God present and then manifesting alive in us that we become that we become animated by the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, you can do nothing, nothing apart from me. He didn't say you could do some things. You do some things apart from me, if you try hard enough, the other stuff I'll just cover. No, he said you can do nothing apart from him. See, this should be, it should all be tying together the nature of grace, the created order, the human person, um, the sacraments in our relationship with Christ in our un- our real union with him in his resurrected body in our destiny to live as resurrected man with Christ 
And Our Lady is a great is the hope of Christians because she, not because she died for our sins, of course not. That's only Jesus. Jesus is our hope is our supreme hope in that regard. But Mary's hope is called the hope of Christians because she has been assumed body and soul into heaven. So she has gone before us as our mother. Now she is here as mediatrix of all graces to pour forth the the grace merited by Christ through his most precious blood into our souls. In, In marriage, this is utmost crucial. Ask anyone who's married. Ask me. I promise you I need every ounce of grace. Uh, Better yet, ask my wife. I need all the grace I can get. I need all of God's life in me. Um, Like, you know, again, these sacraments, this call, marriage is to be sanctifying us and thus calling me to my, the better version of myself. Um, So again, it's, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers spouses to live the Christian ethos of marriage. And as much lust distorts the human heart, and even more so does the Holy Spirit transform and revive it. Lust distorts, the Holy Spirit revives. Again, and use that medical imagery, Christ the surgeon. The Holy Spirit revives. This is why when you give in to the sins of whatever it was, lust, pornography, premarital sex, whatever, lust, it's not just like a one-time thing. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have done that. But no, there's lasting damage, okay? They're, they're, it distorts the human heart. It hardens. And then we need to be transformed and revived and fixed. We need to be brought back to life. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Just as concupiscence darkens the horizon of interior vision and deprives hearts of the lucid clarity of desires and aspirations, so life, according to the Spirit, allows man and woman to find again the true freedom of the gift together with the awareness of this spousal meaning of the body. Spouses are called to chastity as life according to the Spirit. Thus, life according to the Spirit expresses itself also in the reciprocal union by which they become one flesh. GOB 1.6 So again, the spousal meaning of the body reveals that we are called to love as God loves. However, this side of original sin, we cannot fulfill this without experiencing the redemption of the body. The redemption of the body is accomplished when the new Adam fulfills the spousal meaning of his body on the cross, i.e. it is consummated. See John 1930. Uh, One other key passage here from TOB um, 1024 here. The Pauline image of marriage brings together the redemption, sorry, the redemptive dimension of love with its spousal dimension. In some sense, it unites these two dimensions into one. Christ has married the church as his bride because he gave himself for her. Through marriage as a sacrament, both of these dimensions of love, the spousal and the redemptive, penetrate into the life of the spouses. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so with a little bit of the time we have left, man, there's, there's so much... The problem is there's so much to cover is the problem. And so what we might end up doing is um, I might use session eight, which is our last session. This part is so rich and so important that I might use session eight to cover that. We were going to try and squeeze the last three chapters into the last one, but there's only so much we can do. And um, I want to be respectful of you guys' time. So we might use the next session to finish the second half of this one, the sacrament of marriage, a sacramentality of marriage continued, so to speak. And that is the dimension of sign where we get into the language of the body and the reality of the sign, the marital promise. Um, The sacramental sign of marriage is one of the manifold contents, you know, um, there's more to be said here um, about the language of the body, the prophetism of the body. I want to get into all of this next time. And I would also love to get into the Song of Songs. I'm planning on, I bought a couple commentaries on the Song of Songs. And I would like to um, share some, uh, share with you guys some of the wisdom that I have gleaned from that. Because again, that is a really crucial part of 
understanding the spousal analogy and the theology of the body. So we're starting to wrap up here, guys. It's been, um, this is this is seventh session, I believe. Um, it's been awesome to be able to reflect on all this with you guys. Even though it hasn't been in person and the medium has switched multiple times, we have used this opportunity. We've been able to use this opportunity to allow us to um, use this new equipment that we're getting here for this purpose, really, because we want to spread theology of the body all across the world through the medium of media. And so um, we just want, I want to thank you guys for what they're sticking with me through all these weeks. You who are still left, hopefully there's still some hangers, some hanger ons. And um, I would like to, first of all, close with what we started with, which was John Paul II. Um, Let me, I would like to replay that clip for you guys and then we'll end in prayer. So think about, really think about when you're listening, think about all that we've said so far about Christ, about the sacrament of marriage, the sacrament of redemption. I would like to invite each of you to listen careful to God's voice in your heart. Listen to his voice. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Open your hearts, open up your hearts to Christ. The deepest joy there is in life is the joy that comes from God and is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the hope of yours. Is my hope. He is the hope of the world. All right, so hopefully can leave you those words to reflect on from John Paul II. And let's end in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to gather here together to reflect on these teachings of this great saint. We know, Jesus, that even John Paul II couldn't have done any of this apart from you, that we cannot do anything apart from you. We ask you, Lord, on this day to grant us the grace to meditate on what we have said, to apply it to our life, and to go forth as your disciples, Jesus. We pray that you may grant us the grace to be edified by this, to grow closer to you ultimately. And we ask for the intercession of the Holy and Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, that she might come forth with her spouse, the Holy Spirit, and grant every grace through her Immaculate Heart, through the merits of your blood, Jesus, that we need to love you more every day to resist the temptations of this world, the temptations to lust, to using others, to not living as humans fully alive. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you might bless our time here together and that all those who are listening can gain something from this despite my own weaknesses, my, my own inability. We pray, Lord, that you might reach others through me and that those who have listen to this and who have hung on in this class can go forth and spread this truth in the same manner. We pray all of this as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.